and hello everyone and welcome. I have a bit of a different video for you today. On Friday, April 26th, a fellow YouTuber by the name of Not Like This released a video titled Advice for Iron Mace, State of Game, Solutions, Dark and Darker's Great Potential. This was a title that was almost tailor-made to grab my attention. In today's discussion, I'm going to unpack the ideas which the author covers in his discussion, accept and reject premise-level assertions he makes in the course of that conversation, as well as adding in additional weight and focus to areas of the solution space which were, in my opinion, underserved. A big thank you for not like this. Thank you for putting this together. And a big thank you for Ryan six days a week for using your reach to amplify this voice and this important discussion. Now, regular viewers will know that I've spent a fair amount of time discussing some of these ideas and the lack of any product function apparent to us from within Iron Mace's process. If you were ever unclear about what I meant when I said product function, it's exactly what Not Like This has done in this video. By the end of his work, Not Like This has described a game I'd rather play more than the dark and darker we have today. Now, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and pause my video and go and watch Not's video in its entirety. I've included a link in the description below. I'll be here when you get back. Welcome back. I see that some of you didn't follow the assignment, so let me briefly summarize what you missed. What Not has done here is put together a design perspective and a plan to get us off the carousel of chaos testing and design ride that we have been on for some time now. He also lays out data points and design vectors which can be used as guideposts for getting us back on track. He frames the overall discussion into a loose roadmap about what game systems need to be reevaluated, tweaked, or removed for us to successfully change directions in furtherance of an eventual market release, the next onboarding of new customers into the game with, a, with an emphasis of retaining those customers over the long term. In short, his work is an indictment and a condemnation of the direction that the current game's design is taking. He stops short of calling for a vote of no confidence in Iron Mace's designs, but that's an easy inference to draw. I know I did. Still, his work is succinct, well-supported, and frankly, courageous. If I could only give one piece of advice to Iron Mace, it would be to focus on the core gameplay loop. Every time you make a decision, think, does this improve or hurt the core gameplay loop? This is what keeps people addicted and playing your game, increases sales, increases player retention, everything. Greatly simplify this into two phases, the home phase, and the dungeon phase. That's it. The dungeon phase is the most important and it's the main part of the game. This is where most players will spend most of their time. The home phase exists to supplement and help the dungeon phase. We should have plenty of things here for players to spend their time and hard-earned gold on. However, we shouldn't force players to spend a lot of time here. Currently and in the past, you have to spend quite a bit of time gearing up in order to be viable at high levels. This detracts from the core gameplay loop. Not open strong here with an orientating statement. To paraphrase this, everything you do, every system, map, class, or patch, you have to view it through the lens of either strengthening or detracting from Dark and Darker's core gameplay loop. I strongly agree with this statement and the premise. I would only add that content is the primary vector to improve the core gameplay loop. In Dungeon Content. Supplemental systems, tweaks, new game modes are all expensive distractions or detractors from this primary mission. About the most recent issue, which is causing other issues, and that's multiclassing. Multiclassing is completely unbalanced. The class identity is ruined. You cannot look at a wizard and think, oh, he's going to do wizard stuff. You have no idea what he's going to do. Counterplay is ruined because of that. It feels arcadey, like the arcade genre. It does not feel like a hardcore or gritty game. So not wades into the multi-classing subsystem and calls for its complete removal. Perfectly said, no notes. If you'd like to better understood how I drew this 
conclusion independently and hear me bloviate on the subject, I'm including a link to my video, A Condemnation of Multiclassing and Dark and Darker, in the description below. Really quick, I suggest we stop repeating old mistakes. So we've tried the plus two all, plus three all experiment multiple times actually, and we've known it's a bad idea in the past, and yet we tried it again this patch. We tried the plus three, plus four damage stacking meta, and we also know that's a bad idea, and yet we did it again this patch. So why does Iron Mace keep making the same mistakes and making the player base suffer through it? I don't know. Stop making the same mistakes. How simply put, and yet so well said. I feel like I do know. Not like this says we've tried these experiments before, but I would put it to you, we have not experimented at all. Experiments should be designed to test limited select parameters against a control group. We capture measurements and define data ranges as successes or failures of a primary test case. Data is reviewed and conclusions manifested. Long-time viewers know I'm a huge fan of data-driven decision-making and experimentation. I see no evidence that these concepts are in play whatsoever. The carousel of chaos is powered by emotional thinking. Failure is defined by how many customers hop off the ride. Success is defined by the decibel levels of a chorus singing praises to their benevolent development team. Iron Mace, release the data for one of your experiments, which clearly articulates what you are trying to test, why it's important, what you are measuring, and the data set captured from that experiment. Please, prove me wrong. If you think about it, every time Iron Mace repeats a painful mistake, the player base loses a little bit of trust. And of course, again, this is wasted development time. We've tried these experiments, they failed, we learned from them, and yet we redo them. Next, so right now many builds, even without multiclassing, can kill in under a second in one or two hits. Higher time to kill will increase the fight duration, which allows for more counterplay, tactic changes, and skill display. If you die in one second, it sometimes feels kind of cheap, like you didn't have time to react or any way to counter that reliably or realistically. If someone dies to a weapon combo before you even finish it, what's the point of having weapon combos? Like, we need more time to display the cool intricate parts of this game and allow people to counterplay each other. So why is time to kill so short? Well, it's because gear is so strong. And gear being strong causes the other issues, like random modifiers are too strong. They start making GBMM, gear-based matchmaking. Again, because the disparity is too strong, why else would they need it? Highly geared players are destroying low geared players. The range of power between them is too great. And since damage is still high across the board, range meta is very strong. It's low risk, high reward. Time to kill. Yes, absolutely. I'm not advocating for making every character and every class a quote bullet sponge, end quote. But longer time to kill provides a deeper core gameplay experience, rich with opportunities for all manner of emergent gameplay. Yes, counterplay. Yes, preparation and skill expression. But also, longer time to kill creates larger opportunities for third-party encounters with players and complications from PvE and modules, while increasing the value of good decision-making in the heat of the moment. In short, it makes Dark and Darker more of a thinking man's game, and far less arcadey. He goes on to say that gear, it's what's driving this short TTK, and while I think it probably is the primary driver for the current fast time to kill, one-shot metas, etc., there are other factors worthy of a broader, more detailed discussion. Jumping off point. In the next section, not like this goes into his proposal around refactoring gear, gear stat budgets, and additional modifiers to achieve several results. I'm going to hand wave most of this away for a moment. Not because I don't think it's good, not because I don't think it's solid work. I think his proposal is probably far better than what we have now. It's worthy of its own discussion, and we don't have time for that level of detail in this video. At the risk of putting words into his mouth though, I will paraphrase some of his conclusions. Firstly, that gear is too valuable. The stat and attributes budgets on them are too high and this creates a chasm in Delta Gear, 
which is simply insurmountable for most players to overcome in terms of delta skill. He expands on this thinking and ties it back to his initial organizing principle. If we're going to keep gear at this level of value, we are forced to spend more and more time outside of the dungeons to assemble and optimize that gear. Lastly, he infers this point without saying it outright, the larger the gear differential, the worse the new player experience, primarily from predation. And that is, the noob and solo experience has to be good. This is because everyone is a noob or a solo, or both, at some point. The game can be hardcore, but the new and solo players must have a good enough experience or else they won't stay and convert into veterans and paying fans. Next, we should remove GBMM. There's no need for gear-based matchmaking if we fix the gear disparity in general. But, talking about GBMM, it messes up the core gameplay loop. It makes a lot of people use calculators and a gear score manipulation. You're spending way more time gearing up. And if you don't, well, you're at a disadvantage because you might be in a higher bracket. The strength of low gear with good rolls is still pretty high, right, with damage stacking. If I have green gear with plus two damage, that's good gear. It's not bad. So GBMM doesn't really even work, let's just be honest, unless they tie it to the random modifiers or something. Which neatly and succinctly brings us to gear-based matchmaking. No notes. When gear value has been calibrated in its relationship to skill, there is no reason to have it. Leaving it in needlessly subdivides the player base. It's a monument to the inability to dial in the equation of skill versus other factors. Next, the ranged meta is still too strong. It's been this way for over a year, as we all know. But look, ranged damage is incredibly versatile, strong, and low risk compared to most melee in many situations. Melee have to close distance and put themselves at risk, while ranged can just jiggle peek most of the time and shoot off a shot around a doorway, putting themselves at very little risk only to other range damage. Range damage can poke, skirmish, initiate, carry fights, deny areas, deny doorways, stop pushes. You can use it to kite, to chase, to stop kiting and chasing. It has great range across even more than two modules. Like, can we just try an experiment where all forms of range damage, skills, and spells are nerfed, let's say 25 to 35 percent? Honestly, I believe range damage will still be very useful, strong, relevant, and viable. It's just too strong in many situations. So we spend some time contemplating the ranged meta. Okay, I neither agree nor disagree with Knott's assertions about the ranged meta. But this is an area where I'm going to most strongly challenge his conclusions and his proposal. As someone who has over a thousand hours of seat time in Ranger, Wizard, and Cleric over the past year and a half, I'll tell you that the range classes have felt very unfun at the lower gear levels for a while now. I move that we table the conversation about the inherent risk versus reward of the ranged versus melee playstyles for now. My concern is that gear and stat budgets drive or at least are central to the extents which he proposes we then balance around. I think that gear and stats in their current state make having the conversation much more difficult. I propose we start with your proposal on gear budget and only include testing this vector, this change at a later time. The end goal of balancing the play styles and the classes which comprise them, it's important. In the short term, we need to isolate the right variables and systems that we want to test and then test these things serially. If we don't, the data is going to be more noise than signal. Just one man's opinion. My suggestion. All right, moving on to marketplace speculation or reselling. I think we should remove it. This is going to be very controversial, especially among the people that are doing the reselling. But let's just try to be honest when we look at this. Reselling is more profitable than HR bossing. And this undermines the core gameplay loop. This should not be possible. Look, the more money you have, the more money you can make. If you have enough money to buy an artifact, you can take it and resell it and make a chest off it. Like, you can make so much money reselling in this game. 
Reselling causes price inflation, hoarding, speculation, and other negative behaviors, right? Some people just fill up their stash tabs on other characters, speculating on one type of item. This drives up the price. We should remove the ability to resell on the marketplace. If you take something out of a raid, you can sell it. If you buy it on the marketplace, you cannot resell it until you bring it back into the raid. That way people cannot resell. Currently, if 80% of good artifacts, like let's say Viola or Kumas, are sold on discords instead of in-game, then that consolidates economic and game power into the discords. We do not want discord people influence our, our game and the game's economy, but they already do. I mean, look at this guy Ditch or, or whoever you want to. We don't want these people influencing our game. There should be artifacts sold in-game and that's it. We could talk about a lot of shady things in the discords, but let's move on. So, so the author then goes on to discuss his controversial take on upending the marketplace as we know it. He has some ideas about ending monetary speculation in the marketplace near completely. Not, I'd love to hear more about this, but I need your references and I need you to expand on your sources. Personally, I'm so disconnected from the upper end of playing the auction house for fun and profit. I don't have a good frame of reference to be able to really contribute to the dialogue. Before the auction house system, the open air market approach was such a detested facet of the game. I pretty much stopped using it. Now that we have Marketplace 2.0, it's, it's easy for me to get in and out. I support your first assertion, though. As a customer, I find zero fun and very little value in this supplemental system. One thing I'd love to clarify, though, is that if you're playing Dark and Darker at the high end, you have to spend energy on and learn how to play the market. This is a whole skill set unto itself. I mean, just look at the lore. He's a great streamer and player of Dark and Darker, and he's got a great attitude. Each of his videos has, at its start, an effective tutorial about how he himself prepares for and liquidates his inventory and kit each session. Now, Not Your Video has gotten me thinking more creatively about the marketplace as we know it. And I think that I may be a huge fan of testing a self-found only gear system. It's got a lot of benefits. I think one is that players will inherently value more gear that they've worked to assemble themselves. I think it also has the added benefit of killing RMT, real money trading, uh, just dead right there on the spot. I'd wager with that death, we'll also see a significant decrease in the amount of cheating we see in game. The point you're making here, I think, is that gear is too valuable, not only from its stats, but in monetary terms as well. I feel bad I can't really contribute more on this topic. I interact with this facet of the product as little as I have to, to get back into the dungeons, where the fun is. Turn potential. If you're still here after 20 minutes, you are a giga chad. Thank you. You must really care about Dark and Darker. I had some more quick ideas, but we'll skip them for now. The main takeaways for this video are as follows. First, and most importantly, Iron Mace should focus on the core gameplay loop. Every development decision must first consider the impact on the core gameplay loop. This is what makes games successful. Second, they should tighten the gear disparity. This is what's causing so many other issues in the game. High gear players should not be overwhelmingly powerful against low gear players, especially if they're outskilled. And third, don't repeat mistakes and failed experiments over and over again. For example, the plus three all meta, or the plus four damage stacking meta, or else the player's trust and patience will erode over time. I know sometimes the reasoning is that Iron Mace is getting data, but we need to think how much are we degrading the player base's experience and enjoyment. I've taken multiple breaks from this game during bad patches, and I have some friends who have quit that I don't know if I'll see them again. However, I have high hopes for Iron Mace creating a game which brings new and old players to it, and keeps them engaged and having a great experience. Whether you agree or disagree with some or all of my points, please make some comments below. I would love to hear what you say for or against my arguments. I would love to be proven wrong or to hear different sides of the argument so that I can refine my ideas and thoughts. If you can, be very verbose and we can have a high quality discussion in the comments. No matter what you think, thank you for caring about this game and I will see you in the dungeons. And that's his conclusions. 
Very well done and very well said. You and I are in strong agreement on almost all points about your vision for the game. Not, I don't value your work because we agree. You've clearly put a lot of time and thought into your perspective and support it with reason and with data when that data is available. You paint a picture of a game that I have played and want desperately to play again. If you're still here, dear viewer, thank you. If you found this discussion useful, a like and or a subscribe to me is greatly appreciated. If you find the same amount of value that I have found in Knott's work, I have included a link to his channel. I'd highly encourage you to like and subscribe there as well. One other thing in that regard, I always support I'm there for and invigorated by the grand contest of ideas. And I encourage to have that grand contest play out in the comments section below. Though, on the other hand, I have an announcement in that regard. I've decided to go ahead and spin up a Discord server. I'm putting a link to that server in the description below. I'm terrified. I've pushed back on doing this with the community for a while, not because I don't think it will spawn great discussion, not because it's simply a better place to have these kinds of conversations, but because I'm afraid that I don't have the time or energy to shape, moderate, frame the topics to maintain high standards of civil fact-based discourse. Regardless, we're going to try it for a while and see if it works. If you're interested in helping me in that regard, becoming a moderator, I'll have some information about that below. Until next time, Koopa out. When some wild-eyed eight-foot tall maniac grabs your neck, taps the back of your favorite head up against a barroom wall, and he looks at cryptic in the eye, and he asks you if you've paid your dues. Well, you just stare that big sucker right back in the eye, and you remember what old Jack Burton always says at a time like that. Have you paid your dues, Jack? Yes, sir, the check is in the mail.